Hi everyone, so today we start chapter three. So in this chapter, guys, we're gonna go over carbon and then we're also gonna go over the macromolecules. But in order to go over the macromolecules, we gotta learn about carbon first. So our bodies are made up primarily of carbon. In other words, carbon is going to be the main element that makes up a lot of the molecules in our bodies. An organic compound at the bottom here, guys, it is just a uh, compound where uh, carbon is in it. So in living things, we call them organic compounds because they contain carbon and they're in something living, all right? So later on in this chapter, guys, we're gonna go over the four macromolecules in depth. They are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Um, but first we gotta go over, like I said, a little bit of carbon. So here's an example of a macromolecule. That's it all folded up, guys, okay? In reality, if we were to string it out, it would be extremely, extremely, extremely long, okay? But this is it all folded up there. So last chapter, we went over electron configurations a little bit, and you guys saw how the electrons can go into different energy shells with our atoms. Now, for carbon, we're not gonna worry about the whole electron configuration, but we are gonna worry about just its valence electrons. So carbon has four valence electrons, and it was in that weird group that group where it wasn't really gonna gain, it wasn't really gonna lose. So what carbon's usually gonna do is it's going to form covalent bonds with other atoms. Now it could form single, double, triple covalent bonds, but um, it is going to be a covalent bond. So since carbon is able to form these four covalent, or four covalent bonds, it makes it nice because we can form these really, really, really big molecules with it. And why that is, is because since we can attach, you know, four different atoms to it, those atoms can then go to other atoms and branch out. Okay. Uh, with carbon, guys, one thing I want to mention with it. So we have single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds, okay? Now, if it's a double bond, if there's a carbon double bonded to another carbon or something else, usually our whole, and this goes on with number uh three here, the third bullet. Usually if it's a double bond, that carbon is going to be in a straight line. So that molecule will form a straight line pattern, okay? If it's a single bond, meaning it's going to attach four different atoms to it, then it's going to be this tetrahedral shape, okay? So a little bit different. Uh, here are your shapes here, guys, okay? You can see the difference, the uh, ethene down here. You can see the double bond, so it's in a nice you know, planar thing. But uh, up here, it's all single bonds and methane. So you can see the difference between this as being tetrahedral or just not planar, uh, and the one down here being on one single plane. So here is your valence shells. Right? You guys can see the difference between carbon and all the other ones here. So carbon, ha having four valence electrons, it actually can form uh, four different bonds with four different hydrogens. Since hydrogen only has one valence electron, don't forget guys, that first energy shell only holds two electrons. So it's a little bit different than all the other ones because it only wants two in its outer shell. So it's only gonna share one other one with carbon. So here is the carbon dioxide guys. You can see that, yeah, you know what carbon dioxide is. We could draw this out, but um, you can see that there's two double bonds here, so this one would definitely be planar or in one plane, okay? It would be one straight line. Here are some other weird structures, guys, with um, carbon, and you might see them drawn like this, and when they draw them like this, it doesn't make things difficult, it's just a little bit different than what we're used to. So let me move myself out of the way here and I'll show you guys what we're doing here. So. In these ring structures, okay, what do they all mean? Well, each one of these points here, okay, where our lines change direction, that represents a carbon. So we have a carbon here, a carbon here, carbon here, okay? Do you guys get the point, right? So each one of these, given that they're hexagons, except for the end one here, that's a pentagon, uh, each one of these being hexagons are going to have six carbons attached to them. When you see this line on the inside, what that means is between 
let me use this one up here, between this carbon right here and this carbon right here, we have a double bond in between, of, in between them. But this carbon to this carbon here, there's not that extra line on the inside, so that is only a single bond, all right? So just a weird diagram. If you see that, uh, I don't want you to get confused by it. It's just a fancy way to draw uh, orga uh, an organic compound. Okay, there's a few different skeletons, main skeletons you guys may see when studying your carbon chains. So these ones here, uh, we can call them, in your book they call them length chains, but we could just call them straight chains. Either one works, okay? All the carbons are in one nice straight line, and that kind of is almost the same thing as C here. The only difference between A and C, again, they're still in straight lines, but there's a double bond somewhere, so that's why they call it double bond position. This one here, guys, all right, is a branching chain. What we have is a straight chain of carbons and then one coming off of it, and then we have our rings down below. All of these things, guys, we call them hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are molecules consisting only, only of carbon and hydrogen, okay? So in your next bullet point here, it goes over fats, all right? Fats being the key word there. So what do we know about fats? Well, do fats dissolve well in water? No, they don't. So fats are going to be hydrophobic, meaning water fearing, or they don't combine well with water, okay? So if something is a hydrocarbon composed of only hydrogen and carbon, what that tells us is that hydrocarbons are going to be nonpolar, or we could say they would be hydrophobic, okay? So when we have the hydrogen and carbon together, it's hydrophobic. However, if we start to bring other elements in, it's no longer a hydrocarbon, and that can change the property of that. So bringing like an oxygen in or something like that, it might no longer be hydrophobic. That oxygen might make it hydrophilic. All right, functional groups, guys. Uh, these are things that are going to be attached to our hydrocarbons. In other words, making them not a hydrocarbon anymore. So here are your main ones. Okay. We have hydroxyl, carbonyl, carboxyl. Okay, one letter changes the whole thing there. Amino, sulfhydryl, uh, phosphate, and methyl. And here's a picture of, whoops. Here's a picture of all of them, guys. Okay, now let me give you some characteristics of them. So our first one up there, I will write these down for you to make it easier. So our first one is hydroxyl up there. Now hydroxyl is an OH attached to whatever, okay? It's attached to our hydrocarbon. Now if it's attached to our hydrocarbon, guys, it's going to be attached to a carbon, not if you look at the ethanol example here. It's not going to be attached to the O or to the uh, H here. If it were attached to the H, it would form water because the H can't make more than one bond, okay? Um, we would just have H and OH and that's H2O. But anyway, so the first one, guys, alcohol, okay? Its characteristic is it is polar, okay? So if you see an OH group added to something, it makes it polar. Carbonyl, same thing. This one also, if you see it added to something, is going to make it polar. And we're going to talk about ketones and aldehydes later on and, and why they're important. All right. uh, our next one, carboxyl. It's a C, an O, an OH. This is going to make something acidic. Okay. So if you see this, all right, it's going to make that molecule acidic. Now the amino is going to make it basic. All right. Things are get a little weird whenever we have a carboxyl and an amino group together. Okay. Uh, we have one making it acidic, the other one making it basic. What happens there, right? So we'll talk about that later. Uh, sulfhydryl also is going to make it polar. All right. Uh, the phosphate group doesn't really do too much. We're not going to worry about that one now. And then lastly, the methyl group, because it's 
just the C and three H's, this is going to make it nonpolar. All right, it's a hydrocarbon, guys. So you don't see anything else other than carbons and hydrogen. So that is obviously going to be nonpolar. All right, so there's your functional groups, guys. I need you to be able to identify them. All right, it'll make things a lot easier when we go over the structure of our macromolecules. All right, uh, ATP. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate. I'm not gonna worry about the first word, but let's look at the second word there. It's triphosphate. So tri means three. Phosphate, we learned what that guy is right here, okay? So in adenosine triphosphate, we see three of our functional groups. Well, three phosphates, okay? But this is the molecule we use for energy in our bodies. Now, I don't want you guys to think that adenosine triphosphate is like, oh, hey, I need, some, I need some ATP, I need some energy, okay? You actually don't use this molecule directly for energy. Instead, this molecule, this ATP, when we uh, break bonds, when we break bonds in ATP, that's when we get our release of energy, okay? Here's a, a good picture of it, guys. So we'll talk about adenosine later on, what's in it and everything, but for right now, we're just gonna call it adenosine. And then here is our three phosphates attached to it. Now, here's again that picture, guys, of the ATP. So here's our reaction, okay? The P and the PI, guys, just stand for phosphate groups. So what happens here, guys, is we break a bond. And when we break a bond, we now only have two phosphates left. So if we wanted to know what bond we are breaking, if we look at our first ATP over here, we are breaking this bond as we go over to our products over there. Okay, so the other thing is that it reacts with water. So we're gonna have water on, on this side, guys. Oops. All right, so water is gonna be on this side. We gotta add water into it, but anyway. So in our products, guys, we have adenosine and we have two phosphates here. So we use the prefix tri over here. This one, ADP stands for adenosine prefix would be di, adenosine diphosphate. And in that breaking of the bond, guys, that's how we get our energy here at the end. Okay, that is it for section one, guys. Uh, we're gonna do a little bit of section two today and then we'll call it a day. So we're gonna have a relationship between monomers and polymers. So if I draw this out for you guys, um, a monomer, I'm just going to make it as one single circle. Makes things easy. So that's our monomer. Right? Now, in your bodies, we're gonna have a bunch of monomers. They're gonna be all around, okay? So we have all these monomers. So here is our monomers. That's enough, okay? What happens, guys, is a reaction occurs, and instead of having all these monomers broken up because we don't want them all over our bodies because it's like hey i need one of them monomers somewhere uh, okay hold on let me find it uh, i don't know where it's at right we want to keep everything nice and organized in your body so that way if you need something it's like hey i need a monomer oh yep got it right here okay i know exactly where it's at so what we do is we take these individual monomers and we make a bond between each one to keep them together. I'm not gonna draw all of them here, but you guys get the, uh, the picture there. So each one of these is a monomer. When we put them together, this is our polymer, okay? Now, how big is a polymer? I don't know, okay? Um, the, it's kind of ambiguous with how big it actually is, guys, but once the polymer gets big enough, we are gonna combine it with a bunch of other polymers. And when that polymer gets to be a macromolecule, it's no longer called a polymer, it's a macromolecule. So we could say monomers put together make up a polymer, and polymers, once they get big enough or once they combine with other polymers, they become a macromolecule. So there's your relationship from monomers to polymers to macros. So here's two reactions. We're gonna have a dehydration reaction 
Uh, they're also called condensation reactions, okay? Either one works, it doesn't matter, all right? Just make sure you know both of them, but you can use both of them as the same. Um, so dehydration reactions, we are going to bond two monomers together, okay? And then we are going to lose water. And I'll show you how we actually lose water in it, but we'll worry about that later in the diagrams. The second one is a hydrolysis reaction. We have our polymer and we want to break off a monomer. So what we do is we have our polymer and we take a monomer off. And why we might be taking that monomer off is maybe we need some energy, okay? Kind of like we did with ATP. ATP would be the polymer, okay? ADP, kind of still a polymer, but we're taking off the monomer, which is a phosphate. And in breaking that bond, we get energy out of it, all right? Last one here, guys, uh, enzymes. We're going to use them in both of these. You're not really going to see the enzymes, though, so we're not going to worry about them too much. Here's a little video on dehydration and hydrolysis reactions. It's quick. Many important biological molecules are made of repeating subunits called monomers. When many monomers join, the result is a polymer. For example, amino acid monomers join to form a protein polymer, and glucose monomers combine to form a complex carbohydrate polymer. Biological polymers form by dehydration synthesis reactions. As you can see here, each of the monomers in this reaction has a hydrogen or H, and a hydroxyl, or OH, group. In the course of the reaction, the hydrogen is removed from one monomer and the hydroxyl group from the other. The hydrogen and hydroxyl group combine to form water, and a bond links the two monomers. Hydrolysis is the opposite of a dehydration synthesis reaction. During a hydrolysis reaction, a polymer is reduced to its monomer subunits by the addition of water. In fact, the word hydrolysis literally means to break water. The hydroxyl group from a water molecule attaches to one monomer, and the remaining hydrogen attaches to the other monomer. In other words, water is used to break the bond holding monomers together. Let's do a quick recap. During dehydration synthesis, monomers join to form polymers, and water is released. The opposite happens during hydrolysis, where water is added to the reaction to break a polymer into monomers. All right, so you guys saw the difference between our dehydration reaction or condensation, either one, and then our hydrolysis. So why we need water, okay, in our hydrolysis reaction to break it apart is we can't have any loose ends, I guess we can say. We need to be able to add something to those areas where the bond is broken. Bro broken. So on one side, we're gonna put an H, on the other side, we're gonna put the OH from water. In other words, we've got a hydrogen atom and a hydroxyl group on the other side. Yeah. On the other side, for the uh, dehydration reaction, okay, we're putting two monomers together, making our polymer bigger or maybe even just creating a polymer. So on this one, we have the H, we have the OH on those sides, okay? So what we do is we break them off and in breaking them off, now we have that bond, okay? And the water is given off. So dehydration, that's what we say. Instead of saying water is lost, I like to say water is given off, okay? It just makes more sense that way. And hydrolysis reactions, we need water to break the bond. Or, um, yeah, to break the bond. Um, and each time, guys, each time we break one of these bonds, one water molecule is needed, okay? So if we took this thing right here and we wanted to break it up into individual monomers, we have one, two, three, four monomers there, okay? If we wanted to break these up, the whole thing up, okay? We would need one, two, three water molecules, okay, added in order to break it all up into individual monomers. All right. 
So I think this will be our last slide for the day, guys, and we will uh, call it a day because after this, we're, we're done with carbon and we're going to get into the macromolecules, the carbohydrates and everything like that. And uh, we'll save that for a fresh day. But um, make sure, guys, review your condensation, dehydration, hydrolysis reactions, because they are going to keep coming into play over and over and over again throughout the rest of this chapter. So if you don't know them now, um, you're going to get really confused as we keep mentioning them down the road. All right. Um, but anyway, guys, last slide. So what this is saying is the way these monomers are put together or assembled um, determines what type of polymer can be made. So some of the macromolecules we're going to go over, we're going to have a bunch of different polymers that can form. And the way the monomers are put together are going to determine what polymer uh, is made. So, all right, guys, have a good rest of your day.